the uh, protection that uh, is uh, the basis of vaccination is due to the activity of different population of lymphocytes, and particularly uh, T lymphocytes, that uh, my group um, investigated for several years, more than 30 years ago, when I started to, to work on T cells. I mean, there was a conviction that only what was found in mice is true, and what was found in humans was not, because uh, the techniques available at that time was not so uh, precise in humans to allow, I mean, very uh, uh, undoubted results. Anyway, uh, these uh, T lymphocytes that uh, have different activity against pathogens, for example, the Th1 cell protect against intracellular bacteria, Th2 cell protect against worms, and uh, now there is a new population of a factor T cell, which is called T helper 17 population, which is protecting against extracellular bacteria and fungi. <coughs> However, this, uh, I mean, population are not only protective in humans, but sometimes they can give a damage. Uh, they can give a, a chronic inflammatory disorder when they are unable to remove the, the pathogen in a short time, and also they can uh, induce autoimmune disorders because they react against uh, uh, the so-called self, the body itself. Uh, we, were, we are working uh, uh, in the last year on this TLP17 cell population, which is surely involved in several chronic inflammatory diseases in humans, particularly Crohn's disease, uh, uh, some uh, skin, chronic skin inflammatory disorder, multiple sclerosis, and so uh, this is uh, still a very questionable uh, field. It is very important to know the functional feature and uh, the role of this cell in these diseases. Uh, I will not go on the details of our research because it's too much specialistic for the public, the general public. I would like just to, to say a message that is, uh, as I said before, when I started to work on this cell, only mouse immunology was, uh, I mean, uh, important, and human immunology was not. Now, uh, with the, um, after a half century of uh, mouse-dominated uh, uh, immunology, uh, there are a lot of data coming directly from humans, from the human studies, because we, these uh, data were strongly powered by the modern technologies. We have now uh, the genome mapping in humans, we have uh, the gene silencing, we have uh, a lot of techniques which are very important uh, and uh, allow to uh, get results uh, uh, highly, highly uh, sure, even directly in humans. So, I mean, my, my message that I would like to say it, of course, this does not mean that we, we can, I mean, remove mice from experimentation, but now we can directly have uh, a lot of that data uh, directly in humans. And this is very important because uh, not, not, not always mice and humans are identical. Maybe they have, uh, I mean, the same number of, of genes and a very similar genoma, but then there is the uh, environment and the epigenetic changes that uh, uh, allow some molecules to be expressed and some other not to be expressed in humans. And so it's, this is progress in human immunology is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, um, the people who work with HIV, uh, AIDS, uh, have a saying, mice lie and monkeys don't always tell the truth. <laughs> and that's pretty much what Sergio is saying. Um, what has happened, as he says, with the enormous advances in technology, there's now so much we can study with humans and in humans. We can take a single human cell and by using what the PCR technique, the same technique that's used to identify rapists, we can show which genes are being expressed in those cells. So that's 
means we can do an enormous amount with humans we couldn't do previously where we would have needed uh, a bucket full of cells, and that's not, just not possible. Of course, we can't do experiments in humans, but what's happened, I think, and we are, I'm, Rolf and I were both mouse people, MDs, mouse doctors, and um, what's happened is our lab has gone very much more into human studies, and we do experiments in mice, you can't do experiments in humans, but the real reference point is what's happening in humans. And also the area of inflammation, what actually happens. Say in your, you get infected with influenza, the virus infects your lung. What then happens is all sorts of cells, lymphocytes and so forth, come flooding into the lung to try to get rid of that infection. That's the immune response. Now, the immune response is great. I mean, it's going to get rid of the infection, but in the process, it can kill you. And because we are clogging up the lung, which is a very delicate tissue, we have to exchange oxygen into our blood, we're clogging up the lung with all this stuff that's coming in there to get rid of, this, of the infection. And we know that, but what we don't know and what we can't tell our physician friends is what mechanisms should we try and tone down? What should we try and block? What should we try and inhibit? And so there's a whole new area of science that I've watched open out really in the last five years, working with mice, working with humans, to try and help us identify what aspects of the immune response that we need to, to drop down a little, including some of the types of molecules that Sergio has studied so effectively for many years. It's very exciting, and there's a lot of things happening here. And, uh, and we're seeing it in infection, we're seeing it in autoimmune disease, diseases like gout, where we can now block a lot of those effects because we now understand the mechanism. And that, of course, is the basis of all good science, is to understand the mechanism behind disease and then try and target those mechanisms to make that disease process less severe and less damaging. And Just to balance things out, you know, I think this is true for all science. You know, you start somewhere, and then you understand in a model situation how th certain aspects work, and then you go back and say, I, I rather prefer to understand it in humans. So the, I'm not interested in the mouse. But certain things we wouldn't have discovered in humans had we not had these rather, let's say, simpler or simplified model situations. And the second general aspect to sort of, you know, in this discussion is, of course, you know, 200 or 500 years ago, our life expectancy, average life expectancy was 20, 25. This was just sufficient to have kids grow them up for six or seven years, and then die off, you know. Now we expect, we all think we have the right to, be, to get to 70 or 80. Now, biology just hasn't made things solid and long-lasting enough. It's a bit like a car, you know. You buy a new car, you drive it for 70,000 kilometers, and then you start to replace the clutches or the, 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 the tank or the brakes. But 2,000 kilometers later, you have to, to redo the whole body or, or replace them. So that's a bit the problem. Now, when you look at some of these pathologies like autoimmune diseases, they don't kill you at the age of five. Infections kill you at the age of five. That's why they're called childhood infections. So the immune system works exquisitely well against these so-called childhood infections. But then over time, you know, there's all that accumulation of this inflammation and, you know, small things go a bit wrong and too much and, or not enough. And then come all these chronic problems. And I don't see somebody younger than 25. So, you know, that's our problem, to deal with these chronic, slightly degenerative, accumulating types of, of disease. And, of course, that's the medical problems we are confronted with. And there, of course, we have some specialists, you know, and it's a very important aspect of our life.